Well, Moses and Aaron went to visit Pharaoh, and a simple message, thus says the Lord, let my people go so that they might go into the wilderness to worship me, to serve me, to live for me. Uh, Pharaoh, of course, uh, being of hard heart, he did not listen to the voice of the Lord or the voice of Aaron or the voice of Moses or his words or his influence, I should say. And so God brought a plague. The first plague that he brings was this plague in turning the river Nile into blood. And all of the, the fresh water uh, uh, bodies of water, the rivers, the streams, even buckets of water that they had in their home was turned to blood. Really kind of crazy. But when you think about it, uh, this isn't a game to God. None of this was a game. He's, he is it, going through the process of these ten plagues in order to show not just his power, but also his mercy. Uh, his mercy in giving Pharaoh all of these opportunities to repent, to surrender, to give in, and let God be God. Uh, the Egyptian people were uh, very religious people. They, uh, unfortunately, were pagans, and they worshiped many gods. And um, when this turning of the Nile, the fresh water, into blood, it may have been a specific attack against their god of the Nile by the name of Hapi. Hapi was his name. He was the god of the Nile, the one who watched over the Nile, protected it. And so by turning it into blood, it's almost as if God was saying, look, he, he's got nothing on me. I, I am in charge of all of this. I run it all. Well, then we come to chapter 8, and we go into the second plague. And the Lord says, spoke to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord God, let my people go that they may serve me. The message is the same. He's not deviating at all from that message. But here's the warning. If you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your territory with frogs. Well, that's an interesting thing. There is a goddess by the name of Heket. Heket is actually uh, uh, depicted in Egyptian lore, in the pictures, the hieroglyphics, as a goddess or a woman with the head of a frog. And so uh, here we see God sort of attacking her uh, uh, integrity, her ability to kind of control the, uh, the uh, 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 frogs or the, the critters that are supposedly in her control. She can't do it. Um, she is also supposed to be the god of fertility, the goddess of fertility. And idea of the frogs becoming, um, you know, multiplying very quickly. They do rapidly uh, reproduce. And so uh, this head of the frog. And the frog, God says, I'm going to send you frogs. You want to worship a woman who looks like a frog? Let me send you some frogs. I'll give you a ton of frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedroom, on your bed, into the houses of your servants, on your people, in your ovens, into your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come up on you, on your people, and on all your servants. And that's what God is saying. If you don't heed what I'm saying, to let my people go so they might serve me, I'm going to send frogs into your midst. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, and cause frogs to come upon the land of Egypt. And so Aaron did that. He stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Well, that's a terrible situation. I know that, you know, we live in a place where frogs are plenty, but not that plenty. This is really uh, good in plenty. It's like, whoa, this is a lot of frogs. Everywhere you turn, can you imagine going to your refrigerator and opening the door and out jumps frogs? Um, that would be a horrible thing, but that's basically what's happening here. Everywhere you don't want a frog, we're frogs. And so uh, the magicians, it says in verse 7, 
did also the same thing with their enchantments, their sorceries, and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. Now, something to point out here, and that is that uh, they did the same thing with the waters. You remember they, the, that Moses and Aaron turned the water into blood, and so the magicians got fresh water and turned that into blood. So any fresh water they may have had left sort of was lost on this trick of theirs. Here, the same thing with frogs, as if they said, well, we can do that, let's give you more frogs. So the point I'm trying to make is that the magicians, these wise men of Egypt, they could only make matters worse. They weren't able to make matters better. They weren't able to to fix this problem. They couldn't cancel the plague. They couldn't turn the frogs away. That would have been the real way of saying, we're more powerful than this God of Israel. We're more powerful because God sends frogs and we throw them away. No, they can't do that. But they just made the situation far worse. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron, and he said, entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me And from my people. In other words, entreat is a word to pray for or to intercede for, intercede on my behalf. But there is no real repentance here in Pharaoh's life or in Pharaoh's heart over this. And uh, if you think about it in this way, this is really, uh, these plagues may be a picture of how God is merciful towards sinners and trying to get them to repent, trying to get them to come to this place where they realize God is God, and it's, it's not right that I resist him. It's not right that I harden my heart against him, but I should surrender myself to him. And so here is this, again, Pharaoh. He says, please entreat the Lord, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And so Moses said to Pharaoh, Please accept the honor of saying, when I shall intercede for you. So Moses, being a a kind uh, 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 intercessor here, sure, when would you like me to do that for, uh, for your servants and for your people? To destroy the frogs from you and your houses that they may remain in the river only. And this thing boggles me. Verse 10, Pharaoh says, how about tomorrow? (laughs) <laughs> Why not today? <laughs> what, what are you waiting for? Can you do it in the next 10 minutes? Let's get rid of these ugly things. Get them out of our lives. And so uh, he says tomorrow. Why does he say tomorrow? Well, it's perhaps in order to give himself some time to change his mind, to give himself some time to talk himself out of doing the right thing. And the right thing would have been to just listen to the Lord let the people go and let them uh, worship God. That would have been the simple way to go. And so he said, let it be tomorrow. And he said, let it, and Moses said, let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. All right, tomorrow the frogs will be gone. And when they're gone, you'll know it was God who did it. And the frogs shall depart from you, from your houses, from your servants, from your people, they shall remain in the river only, meaning where they belong. That's where they'll be. Uh, And then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. <laughs> I guess goddess Heket uh, was powerless to prevent uh, God from, from killing all of these frogs in heaps. They just died right where they were. They raked them into piles all over the land, and the whole land began to stink terribly. Did you know, dying flesh, that's how it would be. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief He hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. Have you ever noticed when someone does that? You see them in a massive trial. Maybe a real serious situation. 
You know, they, they were spared the, the loss of their own life or the loss of a loved one, and in those moments they become real spiritual. They're going to give themselves to the Lord. They're going to repent. They're going to do it. Well, then they pull through, and they're, they're no longer on the deathbed, or there's no longer a problem, and then they think, yeah, well, maybe I was a little too hasty. You know, uh, they, and, and there was relief from the trial, and so the heart becomes hard once again. They're not as 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 willing to give over themselves to the Lord as they were under the pressure of the trial. Well, that's what Pharaoh is doing right now. Pharaoh saw that there's relief. You know, the frogs are gone. What's the big deal? I'm fine. I'm not going to let those people go. Well, the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now here again, touching the land, touching the earth, the god of the earth, is by, it goes by the name of Geb in Egyptian re, uh, religion. And this Geb, the god of the earth, is about to be touched in a very uh, uh, aggressive way to cause problems among the people, such as these uh, things they call lice. The Hebrew word is not necessarily lice, but more gnats. Anybody from the shore area, you get those gnats that are constant, they come in swarms, and you think, oh, these things are terrible, and they constantly bug you at certain times of year. Well, imagine that multiplied many, many times over as these gnats were going throughout the land of Egypt. And they did so for Aaron, stretched out his hand and his, with his rod, struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on man and beast, and all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now notice verse 18, that the, Egyptian, the, the magicians, magicians, <laughs> the magicians, that's an Egyptian magician, they're magicians. The, the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice on man and beast. And then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And basically, they went to Pharaoh and said, listen, we're out of our league here. This is big time stuff. We can't touch this. We can't do this. We can't create this. We don't know how this trick, quote unquote, was done. Obviously, it was the hand of God. This is the finger of God that's doing this. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them just as the Lord had said, meaning just as the Lord had told Moses, Pharaoh's, though he's going to see the, all these great signs, Pharaoh will not heed. So God already knows the outcome of this, but he's playing it out nonetheless, and he's going to tell us why in a couple of chapters. But here, Pharaoh is hardening his heart again, the pride the stubbornness of man, unwilling to yield, unwilling to give in to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Because that's really what we're talking about when I suggested that this shows us of how God is merciful towards sinners, how he convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and how man is capable of hardening his heart against the will of God, against the Spirit of God. And that's what Pharaoh is displaying here. So now we come to the fourth plague in verse 20. And the Lord said to Moses, I want you to rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. Then say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Now here we come to this fourth plague, uh, no doubt designed to humiliate a fourth god of the, the Egyptian people, this god by the name of Kepri, who is the god of creation and, and regeneration or of rebirth. And so God is now leading Moses and Aaron to sort of embarrass or insult that one god. And he says, if you don't let my people go, Behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants, on your people, into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies 
and also the ground on which they stand. Now, if you have a King James Bible or New King James Bible, some of the uh, older translations, you'll notice the words of flies are italicized. And the reason they're italicized is because they're not necessarily in the original language, in the original Hebrew text. And the idea here is that the Egyptians shall be full of swarms, swarms of insects. This god, Kepri, is really a, a god that, that was associated with the dung beetle, a very uh, popular, I guess, or common, I should say, in that part of the world, the dung beetle, you know, he collects uh, a horse uh, cow dung and kind of rolls it into a ball and pushes it off. And, you know, it's kind of cool to watch, but really a gross thing. In fact, this god is portrayed with the head of a dung beetle. Uh, go figure. That's someone you're going to worship. Whew. These uh, folks... The, the whole point of this is that it, it, the swarms of flies are not necessarily flies only, but swarms of insects, all sorts of insects. It most likely refers to biting type insects. So if you're thinking flies, think green heads. It's green heads and horse flies. And, you know, there are some flies that, you know, you're working out in the yard and they see that you're sweating and they're attracted to that sweat and they bite you. You ever had that situation? They bite through your shirt. I had that quite a bit this, this uh, spring and summer. They bite right through your shirt and they're painful and I curse, I curse them all. <laughs> mosquitoes, another swarms of mosquitoes. So imagine all of these different insects now being unleashed on the people of Egypt. That's what we're talking about, and it's, it's anything that bites, I think, is the way to look at this. I wonder if even wasps were involved in that. And so uh, God says, if you don't listen to me, this is what's going to happen. And in that day, here's a little bit of a change from the previous plagues. In verse 22, I'm going to set apart the people of Goshen, the people who live in Goshen. That's the, the, the children of Israel in which my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I'm going to show you my power. You're going to see this, and, and the, I want you to see this, number one, that I am able to, to do whatever I want to do because I am sovereign, and number two, I'm able to protect those who serve me. There is a benefit, in other words, in yielding your life to God because there is a certain amount of protection that we enjoy as opposed to those who do not follow the Lord, who will not submit to the Lord. We, we've called it in years past the umbrella. As you're walking in the will of God, there is a somewhat of a protective umbrella over your life that, that certain things may pass over you, so to speak. Not all things, but certain things you will avoid simply because you're walking in the right pathway with God. If you're walking constantly AWOL or away from God, constantly in a different pathway, there is absolutely no guarantee of protection from trials, from loss, from strife, from death over your life. No protection. Mercy is a gift and it is not a guarantee. God doesn't have to show mercy to anyone. Uh, he does, certainly, but he certainly doesn't have to. It's only by his sovereign will. And so uh, here we find this, this um, reality. There is a benefit in serving me. That Notice he says, that in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of this land, I run this place. And I will make a difference, he says, between my people and your people, and tomorrow this sign shall be. You'll see what I'm talking about tomorrow when I send these swarms of insects over your people, but my people, not so. And the Lord did so, Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh, into his servants' houses, into all the land of Egypt, and the land was corrupted or ruined or spoiled because of the swarms. 
Well, Pharaoh then called for Moses and Aaron and said, go and sacrifice to your God in the land. Meaning, listen, if you want to sacrifice, just do it in the land of Goshen. Why do you have to go three-day journey out into the woods? Or out into the desert, I mean, the wilderness. No, do it here in Goshen. And Moses, uh, being uh, the uh, spokesperson for God, said it is not right to do that, for we would be sacrificing uh, the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. In other words, it would be an abomination to do so. It would be similar to, the, to someone taking a, a pig and offering it on, on the Jewish temple, on the Temple Mount. That would be an insult to the Egyptian people. We don't want to do that. If we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, well, then they will not, will they not stone us? They'll kill us for doing that. And so we are going to go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) as he will command us. And so Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. Now you go and intercede for me. <laughs> he's starting to negotiate now. Look, this is, this is serious stuff he's thinking. So maybe God will kind of bend a little bit so that we can all be happy in this. Typical of what the world wants to do in getting us to simply compromise the will of God, the word of God compromise, kind of find a happy medium. Some people are so heavenly minded, there are no earthly good. Let's become a little more uh, uh, um, uh, 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 reasonable so that the world can kind of tolerate us. Well, I say, let's just get on fire for the Lord and stay that way and let the world deal with that. It doesn't mean we have to be rude. It doesn't mean we have to be uh, uh, in, intolerant. That's not what we're talking about. But let's be on fire for the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> that's where Moses was for sure. And uh, then Moses said, Indeed, I am going out from you, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice the Lord. Well, this is just the beginning of the, of the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, Neither would he let the people go. Now, you might be asking yourself, why does God fall for this every time? Well, he's not falling for it. He's got a plan here. He's showing not just Pharaoh. Pharaoh has already sealed his fate. God already said Pharaoh's not going to survive this. He's going to harden his heart till the very end. And uh, he's not going to let you go unless I I force him to, and I'm going to force him to, is what God is saying, and it's not going to be pretty. And so uh, Pharaoh is constantly hardening, hardening his heart, not a surprise at all to God. Nevertheless, he is con- God is constantly giving him opportunity, constantly convicting him of what is right and what is wrong, and trying to bring him into a right place But he's saying, no, think again of the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin. This is wrong. This is not the way God would have you do it. There is a better way. Come to Jesus. Turn your life over to him. And there's that, that, oh, I might, nope, I'm not going to do it. And there's that hardness of heart. And it's like this tug of war with the soul that's going back and forth and back and forth. And then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. You notice the the, the message is not changing. This is what we're going to do. There is no altering, no altering from this message. This is the message. The God uh, of, of heaven is pouring out his heart. Please let my people go so I can let you go. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the the hand of the Lord 
will be on your cattle in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the ca camels, on the oxen, on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. So here uh, is really something that's going to affect every part of their life and livelihood now. God is saying, I'm going to uh, uh, put a, a plague on your food. Your military is going to be uh, affected. Your transportation, you're not going to be able to pull your carts. You're not going to be able to, to go uh, uh, into the fields and work because you're not going to have a cow. You're not going to have a donkey. You're not going to have horses. Your military will be decimated because there will be no horses. This will kill your economy. Everything is going to be messed up. Now, here is this, this uh, fifth plague, who is, which is going to affect the fifth god, or goddess in this case, of Egypt, the goddess Hathor, who is the goddess of protection, the one who is going to protect all of these things. You can think military again. No, you're not going to be able to protect, and neither is Hathor, the goddess of protection, going to be able to protect you because I'm going to take out all of your military. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Then the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And so the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. You think that the frogs were smelly. Now the livestock have died, but of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Well, then it says, Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead, but yet the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. So here is Pharaoh's heart being revealed. I don't care about this intruder in my life. I don't care about God in heaven. I don't care what he does to me. But he doesn't realize that his stubbornness is affecting people, lots of people. And that's something about pride, you know. Pride is the kind of thing that affects others more than it affects you. And it affects relationships that you have with people. It affects the way people view you, the way people have an opinion of you. Pride is destructive. And here is the epitome of pride that says, I will not surrender to God. And as a result, many people are going to be hurt. So the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from a furnace and let Moses scatter it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. So soot and ash from the bottom of a furnace or from fireplace, and throw it into the air, sort of let the wind catch it. And it will become fine dust in the land of Egypt, and it will cause boils to break out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, uh, this these... Um, the boils, uh, the Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, it's, it's more like leprosy. It wasn't just like we think of boils, we think of gigantic, painful pimples. This was painful for sure, but it's worse than that. It's, it's like leprosy. The Egyptian people were very big on their cleanliness. They were very clean people. They often bathed in the Nile to stay clean. That's why we always see Moses running into Pharaoh at the river. They were always clean people. Well, the, this plague wouldn't let them be clean at all. And this, it was a putrefying disease. It was very disgusting. And no medicine that they had would protect them insulting or attacking, if you will, the goddess Isis, who is the god of medicine and peace. Uh, and uh, if she couldn't do her job, obviously, because God trumps them, God wins all the time. And so uh, they took ashes from the furnace, stood before Pharaoh, and Moses scattered them toward heaven, and they caused boils that break out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians couldn't even stand before Moses <laughs> because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians and on all the Egyptians. And so 
uh, the magicians didn't even want to do battle anymore. They were so much. They were in so much pain. But notice verse twelve: the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. I guess um, we might say the Lord hardens those who harden themselves. In other words, there comes a point where the mercy of God ends or will cease for those who continue to reject and reject and reject. There is a point of no return. Jesus called it the blasphemy of the Spirit. That when one would say no enough times to the kindness of God, to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, that God says, you've just gone too far. There's no hope for you ever again. You believe that there are people on this earth that there is absolutely no hope for them, eternally speaking. There are people who have said no once too often. We don't know where that place is. We don't have the right to judge someone in condemning them as if, oh no, you've, you've gone to the point of no return. We don't know where that point is. But this is telling us that there is a point. When uh, Pharaoh hardened his heart that one last time, now it's up to God to keep it that way. It's going to stay. God is going to allow him to let his heart sort of his evil, dark, and blackened heart is going to consume him now. All of his thought, all of his life will be taken over by that one thought of rebellion against God. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart. You ain't seen nothing yet, is what God is saying. And on your servants and on your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Your gods are nothing compared to me, is what he's saying. All of your gods are nothing compared to me. Now, he said, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And there's a couple things that he's saying here. First of all, I could have taken you out in one plague. I didn't need all of this. The reason I'm doing this is to make a point. And to make something so incredible, so fantastic, so uh, unbelievably God that no one will ever forget it. Do you know that even the people of the world talk about these plagues? Non-believers, they talk about these plagues. Many of them joke about them. We have a, a, a tremendous event you know, a terrible crisis in the earth, uh, whether it's a, usually a natural event, they, they talk of it as if it's one of the plagues. What plagues? They're referring to this plague, the plagues of Exodus. This is not something that the world is unaware of. They know that this is in the Bible. Whether they believe it or not is another story. But they know about these plagues. And God, that's what he said. This, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power through you, through your suffering, the things that I'm going to put you through, I'm going to let the world know that this was God who did all of this, and that my name may de be declared in all the earth. And that's absolutely what happened. As yet, you exalt yourself against my people in that you will not let them go. But you fail to realize they're not your people. They're my people. And you exalt yourself as if you have power over them. You have some control over them. Notice that exalting self, that's the heart of pride. The exaltation of self, that's pride. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause 
very heavy hail to rain down such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Well, if you think about it, Egypt is arid, very, very dry, very warm area. Hail is not a common occurrence. <coughs> not that they don't have it, they do. But this kind of hail is, is, is obviously of biblical proportion. <laughs> Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field. For the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. Again, merciful. God is so merciful. I'm going to send hail. I'm giving you advance warning. Go tell your servants. Go tell your people. Go tell your family. Get all your animals. Get them all indoors because it's going to come down, and anyone caught in it will be killed. He, notice verse 20, fantastic, verses 20 and 21. He who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in a the field. They ignored the, the warning. Those who heeded the warning feared God because obviously enough has gone by that, whoa, wait a minute, we'd be idiots not to follow these instructions. The word of the Lord says, get your people indoors. Simple as that. Can you imagine the one who said, ah, I'm not going to believe that. And then people died. Livestock died. Everything that was left died. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire. Imagine that's lightning. And departed to the ground, or darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. So Imagine a massive wave of thunderstorms and lightning and thunder and tornado activity and all kinds of terrible things coming. There's like in the, isn't it in the spring that goes through the Midwest of America? Those tornadoes always seem to follow that same track. Well, imagine that going on in, in extreme the severity, and that's what's happening. So very heavy, it says, that there was none like it in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt. All that was uh, in the field, both man and beast, and the hail struck every herb of the field, broke every tree of the field. So uh, powerful was this storm, the hail destroying everything in its wake. Have, have you ever been driving and, and a hail a storm will hit and it, you get the dimples in your car or cracked your windshield or something like that? Um, we did that once. We, we were driving. We got trapped in it. There was no way to get around it. We had to actually dart under a tree to hide the, the car from the, the hail that was falling. It was too late. You had those dimples all over the, the top of the car and the hood and everything. This obviously was bigger hail. It was destructive, destroying trees. And uh, only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. So God once again showing that he protects those who walk in his will. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. <laughs> and the Lord is righteous and my people and I are wicked. Amen. That's, that's the truth. So he says, entreat the Lord that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. So Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord, and there, uh, to, uh, to the Lord the thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. It all belongs to him. He controls it all. He is in charge. He rules. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not fear the Lord God. Uh, you have 
reach that point of no return. And so for you, Pharaoh, I'm, I'm afraid there is no mercy available. It's all gone. And so now the flax and the barley were struck, for the barley was in the head and the flax was in bud, and so the hail destroyed the crops. But the wheat and the spelt were not yet struck, for they are late crops. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to the Lord. And then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, guess what? He sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken to Moses. So these plagues have, as I said, several purposes that we're going to see in just a second. And ultimately, it's to be able to reveal this evil, wicked heart of Pharaoh. And he even admits it, but he doesn't intend to do anything about it. Well, the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him. Do you remember at the beginning of this whole thing, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, The Lord says to let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should surrender to him? Well, this is what God is saying. I'm going to show him who I am. He asked, so here's, here's who I am. And, verse 2, the second reason, that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things that I have done. In other words, this Moses is going to be a lesson for generations to come of the power and the mighty hand of God. And my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Not only this, Moses, but it's going to make you a stronger believer. Your faith is going to be bolstered. You're going to have great confidence in my ability to do so. This would be extremely important, especially now in this early part of his relationship to God, because in the future... He's going to have greater battles against bigger enemies. So Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to them, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Thus says the Lord, When are you going to humble yourself? Let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. And they shall devour the face of the earth so that no one will be able to see the earth. And they shall eat the residue of what is left which remains to you from the hail. And they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. So this is an attack against the god they call Seth, who is the god of, of storms or disorder and disruption. Uh, obviously, all of these can sort of play into each other a little bit. But these locusts are going to be total devastation upon the land. They're going to fill your houses, he says in verse 6, houses of your servants, the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither you, uh, which neither your fathers nor your father's fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's servants said to him, now there's a bit of a coup taking place, how long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve their Lord, their God. Do you, do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? <laughs> well, this is the hardness of heart. You see, when one hardens their heart, it affects the mind to some degree because it leads to the absence of common sense. It leads to the absence of logic. A person no longer thinks correctly because his heart has been so hardened against God. We see it playing out throughout human history. When man's heart rejects God, something happens to his head. He gets himself all messed up and is prone to all sorts of nonsense and uh, immorality and evil. So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh, 
And he said to Pharaoh, said to them, go serve the Lord your God. And who are the ones going, that are going? Who, who do you plan on taking with you into the wilderness to worship? And Moses said, well, well, we will go with our young and old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, we will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. And he said to them, the Lord had better be with you when, you, when, when I let you and your little ones go. Beware for evil is ahead of you. Or in other words, I know what you're planning here, and your plan is evil. So uh, I'm not sure I trust what you're telling me. You want to take your kids? You want to take your flocks? Are you kidding me? I know what you're doing. He said, never. Only, uh, uh, only the men can go. Notice verse 11. Not so. Go now you who are the men, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desire. You want to go do that, you go, but you leave everyone else here. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. And the Lord said to Moses, now stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the, of the land, all that uh, the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And so the east wind brought a storm of locusts and a storm of chaos. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been so, no such locusts as they, not shall there be uh, such after them. You know, we have these things we call the 100-year storms. We've had a few of them in, recent, in the recent decade. Uh, you know, that uh, hurricane that hit in North Carolina just uh, this, a couple weeks ago, that was a massive, massive storm dropping tons and tons of water. Now imagine that along with about seven or eight other plagues, other natural disasters on top of that. It would be it would declared more than a disaster area. People would have to leave the state and move, move to New Jersey or something. These were severe. So they covered the face of the whole earth, at least that region of the earth, so that the land was darkened and they ate every herb of the, of the land and all of the fruit of the trees, which the hail didn't, didn't destroy. And so there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Duh. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin just this once. Ah and intercede to the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. You know, um, again, you know, we say, why does God put up with this? He's obviously planning something, as I said. But certainly God is not fooled by this. Moses wasn't fooled by it. He even told Pharaoh, look, I know you're not going to do it, but I'll, I'll tell the Lord to let up on the plague. And he did. The Lord is merciful that way. But notice again, there really is no repentance. There is an admittance of sin. But repentance means that you turn away from it. You change your mind and realize this is wrong of me to do this, so I will no longer do it. It's one thing when a person admits that something is wrong, and it's another thing when a person no longer does that which is wrong. And sometimes we get to that place where we'll admit it, but we won't do anything about it. That's where Pharaoh is right now. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt. So this is the Lord. But the Lord, in this case, once again, hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go. And as I said, the reason is because it's just too late for Pharaoh now. It's just too late for him. There is no opportunity for his repentance. 
And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, and that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Darkness, and this is a, another plague, the God of Egypt by the name of Ra, the sun god. Um, Ra was the one who made sure that the sun came up every day. Well, not in this case. And it says, uh, it says that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. Isn't that something? They felt the darkness as if it was some sort of spiritual presence within this darkness. And it, it was creepy, and they felt it. They experienced the darkness. And so Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. Three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Meaning, this is telling us that for whatever reason, the Egyptians couldn't even light a candle. Their candles wouldn't work. Their matches, their lighters, their bic, nothing worked. They couldn't get anything to function that would produce light. But they would look over to the land of Goshen, and they saw the lights flickering in the homes of the Egyptians. They're thinking, what's up with this? This can't be, this can't be happening to us. And then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, go serve the Lord. Only leave your flocks and your herds uh, to be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. So he's still now negotiating, negotiating. But Moses said, you must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind. So God is a tough negotiator. And that's uh, what he's getting across. I told you what I told you, and we're keeping it. For we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God, and even we do not know, even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to them, Get away from me, and you better be careful. Uh, he says, Take heed to yourself and see my face no more. For in the day that you see my face again, you shall die. Moses said, you have spoken well. I will never see your face again. Pharaoh, this is the end of the road for you. You're done. Moses would, of course, go on living another 40 years or so. Pharaoh, not, not so fortunate. He's not going to survive it. So that brings us to the end of nine plagues. Of course, the tenth plague is the devastating one. The one that finally gets them to let go, let gets Pharaoh to let go, but his heart was just too hard, and it winds up taking him out. So don't harden your heart against God. Surrender, yield, live for him, walk in his word. Don't ignore it. Lord, we pray you'll help us to take these warnings, learn from them, and live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.